Good evening, New York, and welcome to 30 Frames a Second, the Nat Wood Show. I am pleased to be here as the host today. I'm Coley Lafayette Clark, and so I'm here excited beyond words because we have with us one of the most distinguished men of this century. And I said this century because we are closing the 20th century and coming into the second decade of the third decade of the 21st century. And this man actually closed it for us. And this is Kevin Annette. Kevin Annette comes to us from Canada where he began his career working as a preacher, believe it or not, for the United Church of Christ. And with that work, Kevin, with his dedication to people, dedication to preaching the Word of God, dedication to living the Word of God, that Kevin's new career began. He discovered after having been at his job for some time, and he'll talk with you about it, that the native people, the indigenous population that we call the Indians, were well, oftentimes missing, and so he wanted to know why, you know, why they're not here. You know, you got, you got some parishioners, you want to see them. So the journey to, uh, to uncover his missing clientele, his missing parishioners, took Kevin on the journey that brings him to New York today, that has taken him out into the world, and that has not just made him a distinguished preacher, even though I don't think he considers himself a preacher in the old sense anymore. But it has also made him a distinguished scholar, writer, a prolific writer, one of the best I've seen in probably my lifetime. So Kevin, welcome back to New York. <laughs> Love being here with you guys. I want you to talk with New York today. And uh, uh, we're here in that woods, it's, it's hiding over there, shooting us uh, <laughs> with his camera, listening in on whatever we have to say. And that That's is good. what I'm very proud of because he's also a distinguished man. Nat has been honored for his career as a journalist, his career uh, with the Manhattan Neighborhood Network, his career as a photographer. He is probably one of the finest artists that this country will ever know. Nat Wood, everybody, he's shooting us so you won't see him as you would normally see him with 30 frames a second. This is his show. Kevin. I want to introduce you to our audience. Would you please talk with them about why in the 1990s you began a major project that was spread all the way to the Vatican, the Vatican, way over there in Europe, in Rome, Italy, or wherever that place is. Um, why? It started for me as uh, doing my job as a minister. I figured, uh, you know, the part about looking for the one of the hundred that's lost. <laughs> well, uh, I was always inclined that way, even as a kid. You know, I'd be. I've got a story. My latest book is called The Border. It's somewhere. I think I gave Knight a copy. Yeah, uh, now we have a copy here. Uh, we will show it. In the border, I described when I was a kid. I'd be given. My mom had to lock up everything because I'd be given away all the time. Folks in our neighborhood who needed it, you know, clothing, toys, books, whatever. Right? So I was always kind of like my eye out for the person getting shafted, the underdog, the people you never remember. So that, when I got to Port Alberni, newly ordained minister, I'd been married, uh, not married, I'd been married eight years at that point. We had two children. Um, but now Port uh, Alberni is, 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 is in Canada. West Coast. Okay. Uh, I'd been ordained just two years in the United Church. And I got called out there, accepted a job at a, a small church that was traditionally right, and I didn't know it at the time, right where the missionaries had wiped out the last of the, the Indians who had held out against Christianity the longest. They were yes. called the Ahousa people on the West Coast. And uh, we had quite a history, that tribe and I. Eventually it cost me my job uh, going to bat for them. But um, at the time, I showed up and I thought, well, half the people here are native. I don't see any natives in the churches. I don't see them working in the stores. What's going on? So I went out and found out for myself, because none of the whites wanted to talk about it. 
they all said, well, everyone keeps to themselves. We like it that way, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of mm -hmm. like the old apartheid argument, Yes, right? yes, yes. But, uh, we call but, that segregation down south. Yeah, right? well, yeah. they got it in Canada, but they don't call it segregation. Mm -hmm. They still got this thing called the Indian Act, which uh, you're not allowed to have under international law. It's race-based legislation, right? Mm. And uh, yet there it is still, a, still there. A legislation in Canada, and that's symbolic of the, the kind of society it is, uh, like I talk about in my book, The Border, it, it's very close society, but it's got this image of, uh, you know, kind of liberal left wing, uh, yes, yes. you know, but that's not true on the ground at all. Mm -hmm. And I encountered that as soon as I went on start visiting the native folks, started bringing them into my church. And uh, a lot of the older white folks didn't like that because they had a guilty conscience. They knew what had gone on in these Indian schools where half the children died, but nobody knew it really in Canada until I started publishing this stuff in the mid to late 80s after I got thrown out of the church for, for surfing in this stuff. So I mean for me it began in that way. I figured that's what you do uh, if you're a Christian minister. You go and especially towards the people that you wronged historically, you got to try to listen to them and don't tell them anything but just listen mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. try to look at your own complicity in the, in the whole thing. So, Can you kind of walk us through what you uncovered in the process of listening and what happened to you in terms of the church community. Yeah, well, it, it's... That is the administrative wing of the church community. Well, it started, I, the first native home I went into, I heard stories that, uh, you know, their relatives had been killed in the local residential school. The story I talk about in my, my documentary on Repentant, um, a native fisherman, Danny Gus, told me that uh, his best friend was murdered and buried in the hill behind the school. Because I'd asked him why there weren't any natives in the churches. And he, um, he said, yeah, the whites know about it. They just don't want us in the church because they know what they did to us. And I heard those kind of stories every native home I went into. I used to take food out to people and get to know them. And, and uh, it was like two worlds. I'd bring that stuff back in, into the white world, and they all just said, they're making it up. No, no, that's true. Because, you see, the lawsuits hadn't begun at that point. Yes. So the churches were free to just deny the whole thing, right? Uh, now they put an enormous spin on the whole thing, but um, at the time, you know, they just denied it all. So that went on for about two years. My congregation grew from about 20 to 100 people. Uh, it was full to the day I got fired without cause. And the thing that clinched it was I found out from none, some of the native elders I got to know. I mentioned the Ahousa people on the West Coast. Well, they had uh, the missionaries had grabbed the land and then sold it off to their corporate friends. You know, in the case mm -hmm. of the United Church, the biggest logging company in the world, Wirehauser Limited in Seattle, was a donor and Macmillan Blodell. These two companies were donors to the United Church. So the United Church made sure they got all their land yes. that they'd grabbed from the natives. I found out about that and I said, wait a minute, in our policy manual it says if we have native land in our possession, it's supposed to go back to the Aboriginal folks free of charge and we're not supposed to make money off stolen land, right? So a nice policy, but in practice, there was big money going on. Yes. And uh, I was fired without cause. I was told I had to uh, be pastorally retrained. Pastorally and, retrained. And psychiatric evaluation they also required, right? Oh my goodness. Because I guess it's, it's crazy <laughs> to criticize your employer, I guess, in the mind of the church. So uh, I refused to do that. Of course, there was no basis for them to ask for that. I realized I was being scapegoated. Um, and so I got fired. I couldn't um, uh, get another job within the church. They blocked that from happening. And then what's even more grotesque is the church went to my wife and said, we're going to make sure this guy's never going to work again. Mm. If you want to leave him, we'll pay for your divorce, which they did. And she got custody of the two kids. And this was really weird. They knew she was going to get custody. So they made an arrangement in the family court system. In, and this is what I mean about Canada. You know, the, the courts, the, uh, I'll give you an example, the head of the Supreme Court in Canada sits on what's called the Privy Council, which is the old colonial body of the old boys network. The Privy Council runs everything in Canada and uh, in the government. So you don't have separation of the, uh, you know, mm -hmm. different branches of government. It's all one clique. All one clique. And it's okay. always been like that. Um, and so they made an arrangement with the family court that I wouldn't get my kids. It was all done that, that easily and quickly. So that at that point, I was unemployed, unemployable. Um, mm -hmm lost my kids, 
the you know the smear campaign had started yeah. so I couldn't get to work anywhere but the good side was that a lot more native people trusted me then started coming to me we began that movement that eventually exposed this whole genocide right? well down south we would say the good thing was you had God on your side <laughs> <laughs> well, too many people have said that for the wrong causes, so I'm always leery about but, <laughs> but you walked it through. You have lived <laughs> yours. So you made it, Bob. Uh, there were no threats on your life. You didn't get beat up and that kind oh, of yeah. arrested. I mean, that happened eventually when we began to take on, we began to hold protests. We began mm -hmm. to confront the churches for, you talked about the research. Well, mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. you know, at the university where I tried to get a doctoral degree, but that got blocked as well. Um, I found all these documents, and that's in my book, Murder by Decree. Yes. Online, murderbydecree.com. People can see it. Um, We're going to be sharing that with the books with you, New York, um, and because he has a goodly number of books. But Murder by Decree is the really foundational piece where he starts, and you can get in and begin to walk through step by step and see uh, Kevin's work and what was happening with the indigenous populations of Canada. We need to be clear about that. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Murder by Decree a little further because what I'm trying to get at is where was your protection from the law? Well, it was interesting. There's kind of like this hidden hand at work because the very year I started going to the university, I tried to retrain again, you know, another livelihood, mm -hmm. tried to get a doctoral degree. And uh, that same year, they acquired all of the records. These were microfilm records from the Indian residential schools mm -hmm. in British Columbia. And I began to find material in there that was just mind-blowing. It showed a 50% death rate. It talked about sterilization programs in these hospitals where if you were an Aboriginal and you wouldn't become a Christian, you had to report, you got a red tag, and you had to report, you got, you got put under the x-ray machine. So it's like in the death camps mm. of Europe. You were sterilized that way. Uh, but this was happening in Canada. Canada right up until, well, up to the 80s, and then they began to do it other ways after that. Canada where our men ran to uh, doing of uh, the Vietnam War to escape yep, yep, having to... Yep. Oh, so man. I began to find all this stuff and I would take it down to the... I got invited, I said Native people started trusting me more right? because mm -hmm. they saw the church had thrown me out. So I got invited down to these Aboriginal healing circles in 1996. It started up in Vancouver. And I got in on the ground floor in that and I, I remember this one incident. I brought these records from university, from the residential schools, and I showed it uh, to the folks in the circle, and these were like fairly older people who, as kids, had been mm -hmm. tortured. They'd seen kids killed. They had to bury kids out back. You know, a whole gamut of horrors. Mm -hmm. And one of the women said, "I'll never forgive my mother because she never came and got me." So I whip out this document and I said, "I found this. It's called the application for admission form. Every native parent had to sign it, or they'd go to jail. It signed away the legal guardianship rights to the church." So I said, your mother couldn't do anything. She'd go to jail if she had done anything. And this woman broke into tears. And it's like this enormous weight she'd carried her whole life was just lifted. Mm -hmm. And we took mm -hmm. a copy of that and burned it in the fire after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And kind of, you know, to kind of let people see. And later she said, I don't have to hate her anymore. I could yes. see, I said, put your hate where it belongs, you know, at the real yeah. target. Yeah. Like the, the, our system that tried to wipe you out. And so a little bit of knowledge just amazingly empowering for people and on the basis of that people began to want to do something more than just sit and talk about their pain that's when we began to hit the churches we hold protests conferences we put this in the face of canada for 15 years non-stop and we got a lot of coverage until the shutdown in 2008 when the government official officially apologized and they put in a spin and they had the help of the native chiefs with that they put an official spin and at that point my name was removed from the national media since July 2008, you'll never see the name Kevin Annett ever again. It's like being banned in South Africa. Suddenly, yes. you're just not mentioned anymore. And yeah. um, here we go. Well, this is a New York, I don't know. It's such a story that uh, it's for an African from the United States who's been here through U.S. slavery. Coming out of that history, this is not so overwhelming because we went through a similar thing and then we know that the United States did that with the Dallas Commission which was designed to make sure that the natives in this country were not allowed to continue in their original native traditions and this, that fight still continues but the children were removed um, but we never saw it up close and personal 
Yours is a presentation of the up close and personal of really what happened to the children. And it's still happening. Like what was amazing, Coley, is uh, we held our first international tr uh, forum for this stuff in June of 1998. We invited a UN group, mm -hmm. uh, ERM. We had uh, Aboriginal observers from all over the continent to come and listen to these testimonies of people. And for the first time, we began to hear stories of children still being trafficked on the reservations. Uh, you know, and there's been stuff in the news about missing Aboriginal women. Well, it's actually whole families going missing all over northern British Columbia, still to this day. And, um, you know, it's big money involved. It's to force, like it's always been, to force Native families off their land to get the water, the uranium. Um, Chinese American companies just buying up the whole area. And so there's always been big money behind genocide, right? Yes. And uh, that's unfortunately why that and child trafficking carries on. But um, I often say to people, when one door closes in your life, if you keep doing the right thing, there'll be other doors open. And uh, yeah, I lost my kids, but then I had all these, this new family form mm -hmm. around me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got invited to Europe after things got shut down in Canada for our movement in 2008, when the government kind of co-opted it and paid off a lot of people and that. People in uh, Ireland heard about it. And uh, they said, yeah, we got the same battle here with the Catholic Church, same crimes. And in fact, the death rate in the Magdalene laundries, in the, uh, these Catholic orphanages, 50% plus death rate. Same stories of mass graves, everything, medical experimentation, the whole bit. So they said, look, we gotta do, we got to unite across borders, and we formed this tribunal, the ITCCS, International Tribunal of Crimes of Church and State. And we eventually brought common law court cases against Pope Benedict, Queen Elizabeth and others, and it really mushroomed after that. There's groups now affiliated with us in nine countries. Now, which the Pope is Benedict? Ratzinger. That was the one before. <laughs> Joe the Rat. Even the, even the Catholic Cardinals call him Joe the Rat. He was not a popular man. That's why they did the spin, bringing in the smiley face grandfather. And that's uh, why they, they, they set him aside. Uh, Joe right. the Rat got sent to right. a trap. It's kind of like Bush country. becomes Obama. You know, you got to yes, bring yes, in the, yes. the, the happy face after. After the, you know, but they're all, it's the same, the same monster people, holding yeah, the hand sure. puppets, right? Both sides, right? So, uh, yeah. So it's been an amazing ride. I, I just, but it shows you, you know, when you scratch anywhere, you see the same, same thing. Genocide and crime and cover up everywhere. Well, you know, one of the good things about the Ireland piece, though, is that the, or, the priests began to organize within the church system, I understand. And we get something called here that's not in. In my name. Not in our name, yeah. Yes, it's, not in our name. I met these guys about five years ago now, and uh, they're a group of Catholic priests that want to split off from Rome. You see, there's a policy, and you Monte, can, Wait, wait, let's do that again. A group yeah. of Catholic priests yeah. that want to split off from Rome? Well, it's like the Reformation again, you know. That, I was ready to say, I'm back here again You know, they, Martin Luther. Yeah, and... Uh, it always starts out like the Reformation started out pretty conservative, but then mm -hmm. in mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And it, become, it led to all sorts of things, including the American Republic eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea of self-governance. So, right? yes. um, but in this case, the, these Catholic priests, they refuse to follow this policy, which you can see in Murder by Decree. It's called Crimen Solicitanus. It's a Latin word. Mm -hmm. And it says every Catholic in the world has to cover up child rape when it happens. It's still a standing policy. That they have to cover up child rape when it happens. They're not to tell the police. They're to keep it inside, uh, you know. And if they talk about it, they're excommunicated. And so that's a criminal conspiracy under the law. It's it's telling every American Catholic you have to uh, be <laughs> commit treason. You got to ignore the count, the family the child protection laws of your own country mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of a Vatican policy, right? And a lot of priests are saying no, well, not a lot at this point, but a lot of these guys in Ireland are, are saying no, enough's enough, because over there, they have a tradition of militancy. Mm -hmm. You know, they fought the British for many centuries, and I was there, I'm, when I was there last year, I was, we're in Dublin, we're having a meeting of these folks who want to form a common law court mm -hmm. to put some of these things on trial like we did in Europe. When we went after yes, Ratzinger, yes. right? And we get a call. Mary Kelly, she's an older woman in her 70s. She says, come on, they need us. We go down, and there's homeless families occupying a building. And we go in, and the police are there, the Garde, they're called in Ireland. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and they're about to start busting heads. And Mary Kelly goes and stands in front of them and says, we've got a hundred witnesses here, don't you dare, right? Mm. And they stood off these cops and these homeless people, it's called Take Back the City. Mm. They're occupying, a, Ireland is a basket case economically, yeah, right? Yeah. It's been gutted. And um, they're occupying all these empty buildings taken over and define the police and the landlords. So you're talking about, you're not talking about the Republic, the new Republic. We're talking about talking Dublin. About the, yeah, Dublin. I'm going to be very Republic clear. In yeah. the South. So because the two are there, I just want to sure that, be yeah. sure that our audience uh, distinguishes between the Republic, right. which made recently a deal with the British. Right. And the Republic yeah. is back up. And that's the fight of people here in the fight about that uh, that's going on now in the United Kingdom around um, the whole Brexit deal. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that, that's that fight. So one said they want to remain with the EU, and that's the Republic of 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 of, 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 of Ireland. Yeah. And the other one, I'm not too sure what what their program is, but but that, that's in the public, so the press. But also in our press here has been recently many many stories. So I ordered yeah. some sure many of them have kept up with the stories about what's happening inside the Catholic Church. Yeah. And I want yeah. to come back. I'm, I'm making my way back on another okay. down another yeah. road. But we know that there have been sisters and that the nuns, many have said that they were raped and abused oh, yeah. when they were inducted into the system. Yeah. The priests were raped and abused. We're talking now about the adults and we're not talking about natives. We're talking about whoever became a nun and was inducted within yeah. the Catholic system. And we know that the Pope had said he was going to end, calling an end to the abuse, however, mm -hmm. not allowing local authority, right. not allowing local authority uh, to be involved at all. So the Catholic Church is maintaining its sovereignty as a nation. But they're not a nation, that's the point. I it, know. <laughs> it, it's, it's a make-believe. Uh, there was a, a piece in the New York Times just last week uh, that Pope Francis announces he's going to have a, a new law in the Catholic Church That's right. against child rape, but they don't still don't have to report it to the police. That's correct. No, no, no so reports. it's the same old policy, but he's put a smiley face on it. It's all um, smoke and mirrors. It's nothing of substance, and that's why uh, there's such uh, a revolt going on inside the, the church. People are wo voting with their feet. Like I uh, give you an example of that. When I was in Dublin last year, mm -hmm. Mary Kelly took me into Pro Cathedral. It's the biggest cathedral in downtown Dublin sits 500 people. Mm -hmm. We counted 32 people there on Sunday morning. Mostly right. older folks, right? Sounds like New York. <laughs> I mean, it's falling apart from the inside out and they're in panic yeah. mode. They don't know what to do. And um, even their their, their spin doctor, uh, Pope Francis, Jorge Bergoglio, he's got a lot of skeletons in his closet that's coming out from the military uh, junta during the dirty war in Argentina. Mm -hmm. This man went from being a priest to head of all the Jesuits in three years. The same year the military took over, and then he became buddy buddy. He became like a PR man for the military that were killing over 30,000 of their own people, just like mm -hmm. in Chile, mm -hmm. throwing mm -hmm. people out of helicopters in the ocean. Uh, Bergoglio uh, knew about that, and he turned a blind eye. He knew his mm -hmm. own priests who were working with the poor were being murdered, and he didn't mm -hmm. say a thing. And all of that is coming out now, and so it kind of goes against his whole liberal image. I mean, when he was in San Francisco, he applauded this Franciscan missionary, Junipero Serra, who had killed over 100,000 Indians, worked them to death on this plantation in the 1700s. Yes, yes. And he said, we're inspired by his zeal. Like, hello? <laughs> well, like, it, these guys, their, their ideas never really change. Just the appearance, right? Yes, that yes. It's okay to wipe out somebody if they're not a Catholic. I mean, it, it's just crazy, right? I mean, it's crazy, but I, I was coming back down this road because I wanted my audience to understand that we are talking about Canada where Kevin has established clearly that there was a, a war on Native people by church and state, the church and the government of Canada. But let us identify these churches. We started out with the United Church of Christ. And United Church of Canada is called. Of Canada, I'm sorry. But there, there is a United Church of Christ down here. There. Are, no, I know there too. Canada. Yeah, yeah. I don't Canada, want to confuse yeah. them. Yeah. United Church of Canada, but there's also the Anglican Church, which would be more of one would think of the Canadian base, since it's a British was right. a British colony. Church of England, yeah. So we want to be very clear that the Church of England, the Anglican Church, we have the three of them. 
So we're not just stopping on Catholic. The all we hear is Catholic. Can you explain at all the thinking? Well, yeah, there was more than the Catholics, but they set up the model originally. Mm -hmm. They've been at it the longest. Um, they have diplomatic standing at the United Nations for some reason, and mm -hmm. the Anglicans don't. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. they've got a lot of inside track and a lot of money and tradition to doing this. They ran about two-thirds of the schools in Canada, these death camps. They call residential schools. But, of course, the Church of England, it was really London and Rome. It was like mm -hmm. a tag team mm -hmm. yes. between Church of England, Church of Rome. Uh, the United Church, which is actually the one I used to be in, was set up by the government of Canada mm. uh, in 1925 to like assimilate the savages was kind of their, their yes. whole thing right? and the immigrants come that in. That late in history. Right, 1925, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, it was tag team and the thing is when the lawsuits started, the churches all got together, they planned their legal strategy together, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they had support of the government. So this church and state, they operate as a single body in this crime and in the cover-up that's happened since then. Yeah, that's why I was really concerned about it because you know we see a lot about the queen these days yeah. in the news. We see a lot about the black sister who's married into the family and the new baby and all of this stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, but we don't hear Anglican or Church of England when we begin to talk about the crimes of church and state. And so I just want to be clear to the audience that's listening is that the Anglicans are as much a part of this yep. as the Catholics. Very much. And they're called Episcopalians in America. Uh, mm -hmm. Like George Washington was yes, his yes, family, yes, right? yes. Oh and my like God, high, high church stuff, a kind of Catholic wannabe, right? <laughs> the, the Queen's the head of the church, not the Pope, but actually to a Christian, Christ is the head of the church, not Queen or Pope, right? But um, anyway, that's what I was always taught. That's right, that's right. But um, anyway, um, the thing people need to know is we did an excavation, the only excavation that's ever happened at a residential school mm -hmm. in 2011, 2012. Okay. got invited there by Mohawk elders in Brantford, Ontario. It was a Church of England school. It was the el oldest one in Canada. It's mm -hmm. called the Mohawk School in Brantford, Ontario. Mohawk natives. Yes. And we they got driven out of New York, of course, mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. General mm -hmm. Clinton, sure, sure. Washington. Their name for Washington is Crop Burner. Because he, <laughs> he burned 100 miles of Mohawk corn to drive them up into Canada. Well, he might have done that, but still to this hour, you see even black youth who will wear their Mohawk hairstyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they're still here. So we got invited there. Uh, we found, we brought in forensic specialists. We did a dig right where eyewitnesses had seen children get buried. Mm. Uh, we found bones. We sent them down to the Smithsonian Institute. A guy called Dr. Don Ortner analyzed them and said these are the bones of a child about five years old. Mm. They've been burned and cut up, probably incinerated after being chopped up, was his diagnosis. He offered to come up and work with us. Mm. Six weeks later, he dies of a convenient heart attack. So that didn't happen. Maybe it's a coincidence, who knows. But um, the net effect was the government moved in quickly through their government chiefs, have paid mm -hmm. collaborators. Mm -hmm. They shut down the dig. Um, not one media outlet in Canada reported the first dig of a residential school grave in Canadian history, yet it was totally censored out of the media. Um, and, you know, the usual smear kicked in about all everything we did. Um, so, I mean, that's the point. This stuff has been professionally run from the start, this cover-up. Mm -hmm. Clearly government or people with big money covering mm -hmm. this stuff mm -hmm. up, silencing witnesses, the whole bit. But no, that was Church of England School. There, people described horrible things that went on there. Experiments, tortures. Yes. Um, even eyewitnesses, they said they saw sacrificial ceremonies going on, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I've heard elsewhere too. It's fairly well described. People who don't even know each other tell the same kinds of stories about that. So pretty horrendous stuff. Yeah, this crimes of church and state is really something that we really are going to have to wrestle with. And you have been our major leader out here on the front line, not only uncovering and presenting the information, but coming up with the strategies and participating with the groups locally and internationally that are trying to face some of this down. I was wondering if there's going to be, if there's been any relationship between your work and the nuns and the priests who are now coming out and saying, hey, look, in terms of our induction into the system, this is what we go through. Are any of them now coming on board and sent to work around what's the genocide that we're talking about? Well, they've, a few of them have been on board all along, okay. but they don't like to come out publicly. It's like an Aboriginal stand. person. Yeah, if sure. you come out, you're dead. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I got a pale skin, so I'm still alive. It's helped mm -hmm. me, right? Mm -hmm. I was known. 
um, they don't kill people like me. They just try to discredit and get people yeah. afraid of them, so they don't listen to what they have to say. But um, now there's the the topic is more respectable. It's more legitimate now to talk mm -hmm. about these mm -hmm. things. So you find more people coming out. Um, same thing though. I remember right after I got thrown out of the United Church, every clergyman in the United Church got a special letter saying if the name Kevin Annett comes up, you are not to respond to this fellow. You're to refer any of that to the legal office in the national headquarters. And all the clergy in the other churches who said the same thing. There's an enormous scare campaign around me for some reason. Like I'm such a scary guy, right? Um, but um, so there's a lot of fear about that. And churches are cultures of silence. You know, people are not supposed to talk about things, especially clergy, you find, right? Uh, so it's hard to get um, about a third of all, this is an amazing figure. I found out uh, there's about a third of all clergy in North America at some point get some, fair, some form of uh, work dismissal, unfair labor practice. They're either fired, uh, without cause. They get jacked around really bad, and yet they never talk about it, right? Um, and so it's a really, it's got one of the highest professional burnout rates of any group. I think yeah. cops and uh, paramedics and that have an equally high rate of divorce, mm -hmm. alcoholism, mm -hmm. all that, mm -hmm. so with clergy. But nobody talks about it, right? I was part of an attempt to actually unionize ministers, uh, mm. well, right after I got fired. And we got as far as uh, the auto workers union was actually going around certifying uh, clergy. And so this wouldn't just be ministers, but the janitors, the church secretaries, yeah, sure. everybody in the United. But Canada, you know, people got cold feet and um, whatever, but, you know, it didn't get very far. But when you got to, like these clergy in Ireland are saying, not in our name, that, and the nuns being raped, you hear those stories all the time. Um, mm. Happened to my friend Yvonne Mays, who used to be a nun in Africa, and she got raped by priests, and when she tried to make an issue of it, they locked her up in a psych ward. You know, they said this woman is mentally unstable, the whole bit, right? She got put through the ringer. So there's a lot of tales out there, you know, in the, in the church, and we've got to become, we've got to open that up. So yeah, that, no, it's, a, it's important, but, but the church. Yeah. We're talking about three that we have mentioned here today. Yeah. But you hear similar stories coming from Baptists, Methodists, and other churches within the United States of America. I don't know about Canada. I have a young student in my class who came in whose mother knew that she was being taken advantage of by a yeah. Baptist preacher. Yep. But Every, yet allowed it to yeah. go on, you know, from the time she was 14 years of age. Well, you know, you hear it, you get angry, you want to fight, and it's like, well, frankly, you know, fight, you know, Crowley, you hear it in other denominations. I've had people, uh, Jews, Muslims. Uh, I even got a call from um, um, Harry Krishna. Mm. fellow who said mm. that children are being trafficked in the Hare Krishna movement. So it's almost like any religion, they stay protected, they don't have to pay taxes. There's a whole aura that we can't be touched. And you're tempted to play God and have that power over people. So I think it's but a God systemic rape. problem. Of course not, but... God doesn't, 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 doesn't kill children up. It's because no. you can kill them up. No, but and, I mean... And there's even evidence that some of these people are killing them for food. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, so, you know, the crimes are just unbelievable. And I got a, a call I had on my radio show, um, which I do on Sundays, uh, a woman who used to be a fairly high up member of the Mormon church, Salt mm -hmm. Lake City. She described to me as a young girl being taken into ceremony. She was ceremonially raped. She saw people getting killed. Catholic bishops showing up and leaving with Mormon kids and never being seen again. Uh, and now uh, uh, there's got to be some strange relationship between the Mormon and the Catholic. The Mormons just opened a temple in Rome, and the Catholic Church considered them a pagan cult. And yet here they are with a new temple and wow. a private audience with Pope Francis, the head of the Mormon Church. So they've got a, a, some kind of relationship there. So, I mean, at that level, it's the same kind of corruption going on in these these churches. You know. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I hear it out of Africa. I knew a young woman that I was in school with, um, yeah. in college with, we talked about being raped, and this is years upon years before I met you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being raped in Africa and how popular, by the nuns. Uh, and it was tied to her culture, because she, you know, nothing you couldn't tell your father. Yeah. Because they sent you to this school, you know, to get an education, they, ex they had great expectation for you. And here you are being taken advantage of, and you can't even report it to your family. Yeah. 
because of cultural ties of various sorts. Yes. I mean, it's, it works in a number of ways, but, but we need to begin to continue this discussion, and we need to continue this discussion in the community. Because if this is going to end, then the parishioners and the church need to revolt, and the community needs to revolt. I grew up in a time down south when it was said, if the devil was in the church and they won't do right, throw him out, right straight on out. And you let the church go on. So we need to turn it around a little bit. The devil's in the church and they won't do right, you throw him out, right straight on out, and let the children live on. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we have to begin to protect the children of the planet. That's our responsibility, it seems to me, yep. as human beings. And it seems to me that has been the thrust of your work. Well, yeah, and it keeps, it's funny, it keeps, uh, like anything you stay at over a lifetime, it keeps growing all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. people come and, and uh, one of the things that's been a disappointment is the people who you'd think politically would back this stuff haven't been there. And um, uh, my background for 40 years has been on the left in Canada. And, um, you know, it, it's ironically, when this first began to come out, and here's a classic case, um, there was the editor of the Pacific Tribune, it's the Communist Party newspaper on the mm -hmm. West Coast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, when I first began to bring this stuff out, I went to them because I figured, well, you know, uh, they're natural allies for this stuff, I assume. Yes. And I remember the editor looked at me and said, the United Church can't have killed children. My own wife is a United Church member. And I thought, I didn't see the, uh, the logic there. <laughs> but, but unfortunately, if you stay in one place, I think, you can become part of the status quo mentally and you don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, a lot of people who I would have thought would be natural allies are fairly conservative when it comes to things like genocide in their own backyard. Yeah. Um, I remember I had a friend, uh, Neil Cohen, he was a white South African. He said, growing up in apartheid South Africa, it didn't matter what your politics were, you were on one side of the barricade and you weren't suffering. You know, the whites mm -hmm. had it privileged mm -hmm. and you could call yourself left wing, but were you really part of the solution, really? Maybe in your own mind. I find very similar with apartheid in Canada, but mm -hmm. Aboriginal mm -hmm. stuff, like the left, and I don't, don't want to run them down because they're just a victim of their own culture and environment, I know, and I was there until... Run them down. Yeah, but... but <laughs> it's like, time. <laughs> but they're not there, like there hasn't been anyone from the left who supported this campaign. And I think it's kind of the attitude of, uh, well, if, we had, if this genocide had been going on, we would have known about it. Right, like why wouldn't why wouldn't we know about it? There was kind of that mystified thing. Um, but even when we held protests in that, people didn't show up. They said, "Oh, we can't pick at the United Church. We hold our meetings there, or they've supported our our unemployed coalition, so we can't attack them." And I said, "But yeah, but these are children's lives. This is genocide." Uh, so I think uh, you know, white privilege really affects. It doesn't matter what your politics is. You have got to really look. You got to have your life turned inside out like my head was mm -hmm. till the scales don't fall from your eye when you're part of that privilege you know and so uh, that's that's something I hope will change right but I don't know that it hasn't become a little bit of back privilege as well these days and we certainly don't have any privilege here. but the ability to turn away when you see yeah. what's happening or to close your ears and pretend you don't hear yeah. the screams and cries. And right. I think it's now cutting across all groups. Yeah. In 1968, when they assassinated Dr. King, the United States of America passed a Native American Civil Rights Act. In any other culture, this would just be unthinkable. A Native American Civil Rights Act? Hmm. The Natives fought it, of course, but it was passed. So natives would have been pulled into the control of this government. Mm. So the indigenous nations and peoples, so, so they fought back. Mm. So we, we, we have to begin to, I think, make it clear, and you have been on the front line out here, but we have to make sure that your work is clear to, to everybody that these indigenous populations are here. And that no, we don't have a right to take their land. We don't have these rights because we set up a government. And George Washington, when speaking to the Continental Congress in 1787 about the coming new republic, which would be in vogue by 1789, was very clear. 
about what the goal of the new republic would be. That's the one we call the United States of America. The goal of this new republic would be to destroy the wolf along with the savage. Mm -hmm. The savage were the indigenous populations moving westward to establish a beachhead and from there southward. Mm -hmm. So we will see the Monroe Doctrine by 1821-22. They're southward to create the, uh, uh, the European Empire. Right. So this is from the beginning. I mean, these, these plans were clear, and it, step by step. And everybody, Adams agreed with him. Thomas Jefferson agreed with him. Everybody, there was oh, yeah. not one single soul among the leadership that did not disagree. Adams said, reluctantly, yeah, I agree with you, but I think we'll have to pay for this one day. Mm -hmm. You know, there'll be some fallback from it. Thomas Jefferson also said, well, you know, it's got to be done, but, you know, he's a little, didn't want to push his feet in, but said, you know, I agree. So when we began to talk about what's happening, we have got to begin to, to look at the Kevin and that's and your genius and your ability to take an issue, research it, and bring it to us in a way that's clear. We can see what's there. And we're going to have to do it because it's not just happening in Canada. No. It's happening in the U.S. It's happening in Central and South America, where the present pope was once in Argentina, yeah. where kids are missing. Well, it's a global industry, this child trafficking and this system. And it's, it's, a, it's like everybody's on the reservation now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that recent example in Rockland County where all the kids had to be vaccinated. Yes. And the parents would go to jail if they weren't for six months. That's like right out of the Indian Act. If you didn't put your kids in a residential school, you go to jail for six months. That's right. Right? And uh, people are acting shocked now. Well, it's been going on for a long time, people. It just hasn't happened to you. And now we're all getting a taste of what it's like to be on the reservation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And, uh, you know, if anything, that means we've got to unite now. That's the thing. We've got to have that basis of unity, regardless of your politics or anything. Yes, yes. Defend the earth, defend our liberties, defend our children. I mean, what's more basic, right? Yeah. Blessed yeah. the children. Yeah. Come on to me. I mean, we want to play the Christian game. Uh, yeah. Oh, but we're well. going to have to begin to really move religion. And well, Africa, they're saying now, remove it off the stage. Mm -hmm. It's all over. People are saying they don't want no Christians. They don't want no Jewish religions, no Hebrew religions. They don't want the Moors. They, they don't want the Muslims, they yes. want to just move all of them off the stage. This whole movement going on to move all, all religions off the stage yeah. because they're saying that religion is the problem. Now, I don't know. I hope down south, I say, oh, I don't know, I ain't the Lord, but I tell you, we better do something more than pray uh -huh. because I think people will come to an hour and as we begin to wake up, well, people are saying, you're not going to kill us and you're not going to kill our children. Mm -hmm. That this is just an un unacceptable way of living in the world. That's there's another way of living in the world, but that means that we're going to have an uphill battle. It's an, it's an uphill battle all the way. It always is. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah. But it's doable. Yeah. And so it's that time, New York, when we have to begin to talk about you and I as individuals. I was on the bus yesterday, and as we passed the Church of St. John's Divine, this gorgeous uh, building there, this woman was just, she was just just going off because it was her church. And, and look at, you know, just this ecstatic about the building, <laughs> about the structure. And I was saying to myself inside, you know, but what about what's in that building? Mm -hmm. What's coming out of it in terms of thought? Now, I don't know that, it's a, that they've got issues. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put them on St. John's or any other church. But we need to begin to rethink religion. Mm -hmm. And for Africans who came here who were inducted into this Christianity. Because yep. this is not ours. Yep. It's a hard game. For the natives who were forced into it, it's not ours. Yep. Red Jacket being forced, and this is a native chief in the 1830s, right after the wars on them by Andrew Jackson, who had become president of the United States. He was so vicious when he came through Jackson, Mississippi, they renamed it the blue and beautiful Lafleur's Bluff, uh, the Gulf of Flowers, Jackson. Uh, but this man uh, was so violent that what they did was they began to, right after his administration was going to the White House, began to force natives uh, to meet with Christian groups. So they were bringing all of these Christian groups from all of the denominations that were present at the time 
out to Red Jasper's territory, I believe he's Red Bird Sioux, but bring him out to Sioux Nation. And they were demanding that the chiefs be present. They demanded their presence. So he came in to show his disdain, his disgust at this outrageous request. He said, you know, you already got my land. Mm -hmm. It's not the gold and silver, and that, 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 shouldn't that be enough booty for your bounty? Yeah. You got that. There's nothing else here for you. Get food. I mean, you got that. You got the land. You can grow food. You remember Fred, Frederick Douglass's description in his biography about when his master became a Methodist. He had a conversion. Yeah. And he said, "Oh, good. He's had a. He's seen the Lord. Now he's going to free us." And he yes. said, "No. It made him even worse. <laughs> it, he beat me even worse because he had the Lord on his side now, right?" Well, Red Jacket was real clear. <laughs> you could take your religion and go, because the Great Spirit already owns my soul. Right. <laughs> you know. So. What's it? I think that either Frederick Douglass or Ab Abraham Lincoln said, he asked what his religion was, and he said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's the extent <laughs> of my religion. That must have been Frederick before he, I got, think so, before he got ordained. His church up at uh, Rochester now where he got ordained, uh, oh, yeah. I think it's becoming a dollar store. Uh, Nobody fought for it, so, you know. Yeah. These great men, these great minds. Um, their words remain with us, but they seem to have left the stage, and we've got Kevin on that. We got well, I'm, I'm looking, I'm 63 now, and I'm, I'm looking for somebody to pass the torch on to. So I'm really looking for people in the young generation. Edu a lot of what I do, I go around and give lectures, workshops, mm -hmm. to show people how we can set up these common law courts, how we can bring the community together to protect our children, right? When the courts aren't going to do it, we've got to do it. So right. we will be showing your, your information so New York can call on you. Yeah. And wherever the show goes out to, and yep. it goes out to millions nations worldwide. So um, and they can June. call on you, yeah. young people especially. Yep. End of June, I'm coming back in New York. All right, I'm, the end of June? Uh, and right. early July, uh, we've got a thing going on at the United Nations, which we can talk about sometime. Well, we need to talk about that today, right? Okay. Because maybe some of the people can get that, especially you young folk out there, because it is time we close the 20th century. Dr. King wanted it closed. He said uh, in his work, looking at the Poor People's Campaign, civil rights is behind us. It is time that we move to human rights. It's right. time we accept we're in the age of cybernetics. A whole new era. Of course, they wiped him out immediately. Yeah. Because they recognized where he was going. He was, yeah. you know, he said, no, we're in the world of people building, developing nuclear weapons and stuff. We cannot afford the, 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 what we've been doing in the civil rights era and black folk in this country, holding on to this group of leadership and ideas from the civil rights movement. It was fine for the civil rights era. It worked well. We got a civil rights bill for what it's worth. Affirmative action was dead by 1990, but that's all right. We still got that stuff. He couldn't see the death of affirmative action from where he was standing in 68, I'm sure. But to be able to pick up and move on, meaning it's time for a new leadership. Mm -hmm. And that leadership has got to step up to the plate and we have got to accept them. Yeah. And we elders, and I'm not referring to you because I got you about 17 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're referring to the, the, you're still youth and you're still where leadership needs to be. But we've got to bring out another group to be able to replace us because this work that's being done, the yeah. scholarship, and you have been the finest of any scholarship anybody's uh, I've seen but it, from anyone in terms of your writing, your thinking, but that scholarship needs to be taken advantage of to develop new programs, new policies, uh, and that's young people's job. That's the job yeah. of young people. So young New York and young wherever this goes out to, uh, Kevin Annette is making himself available. Yes. He's making himself available. And I'm sure that's true for Coley Lafayette Clark, and I'm sure that's true for Nat Woods. We're making ourselves available to you. Mm -hmm. You've already been out here on the battlefield for a lifetime, but now is your time, your journey. And all of this work is being done, and this man's family was destroyed and pulled apart. Uh, a struggle for him always uh, re redefining, and I'm sure trying to pull his children back in. But it's not easy to be hurt in that way. So it's time for you to help him to bear this cross uphill. 
if we want to call it a cross. Whatever we want to call it, it is a battle that's got to be waged against an enemy that has no respect for human life, nope. no respect for any animal life, no respect for the beautiful trees in this garden in which we sit, no respect for bugs, bees, and birds, no respect. And once we understand that we are dealing with that kind of an animal, I don't care whether we put a building around it or camp around it and call it a church, or whether we call it a school, or whether we call it a community. It's an evil institution. Yep. And we have the responsibility as adults to do what this man has been doing to the point where we've got a whole clergy out of Ireland saying not in our name and ready to post those documents that Martin Luther published a long time ago yep. that gave the Catholics hell. Uh, yep. it's, it's that time, it's that hour. It is time and it's, uh, you know, the Mohawks who I work with have a word in their language and it means uh, the closest English word is uh, reclaim. They, they, they set up roadblocks to reclaim the lands, keep the bulldozers out of the little land they have left. But it, they said, it starts here. You've got to reclaim what's in here first. You've got to reclaim your mind and your heart. Pull your soul out of the system. Mm. You can't do anything with you do that unless you do that first. So this you could call that a spiritual battle, very much, without putting the name on it, mm -hmm. religion it or anything. But it is. Think, yeah. It's it's coming from here. Yeah. That's where it is, right? And um, I often say to people, I'm an exile from my own country, my own culture. Because in the book I wrote, The Border, uh, I'm half American. My father's from Fort Lee. New Jersey, and uh, I say it's my American side coming out all the time, this kind of ass-kicking side, right? Because in Canada, uh, you know, you just, people go like that if you if you challenge authority at all, right? Mm. There's a fear of, uh, of authority that you don't get most places I've seen in America. So it gives you a real advantage, me a real advantage working out mm -hmm. here. So. Mm -hmm. But what a contradiction, because if we looked at it from the African perspective, yeah. this is the place we ran to. Yeah. I mean, that is the history yeah. for freedom. And when they tell that story, they don't tell folk, yeah, we ran there for freedom, but we were running to a slave country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Canada had slaves. So, I mean, so this... Indian slaves, too. This mythology, yeah, everybody had Indian slaves. Yeah, yeah. This, this mythology that we get that needs to be kind of overcome so right. that we can begin to understand yeah. that there's a Canada. Our brothers ran from here during the 60s in the Vietnam War. Yeah. This is where they ran to. Mm -hmm. This is where they had freedom. This is where they had Canadian radio and Canadian television that was a far cry better than anything and freer than anything before they wiped them out than we had here. So these contradictions have to be dealt with and sorted yeah. out so that we can see the, the real distinction between Canada and that thousand years of peace between it and America, mm. all of the stories that we get when we talk about the history of Canada and its relationship to the U.S., yep. we got to sort it out. Of course, the Irish who came there by the, who there by the hundreds of thousands here, uh, looking for a new way of life, could have sorted it out for us if we had just listened to them when they came in the door. Yeah. But we we got to sort it out somehow. But you've got a number of books. Do you want to talk about the books a bit? Well, there's two of the mentioned You mentioned the, 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 the borders. Yeah, the border is a recent one. It's kind of more, uh, you got to see humor in this or you go nuts, right? So I've been trying to write it from a more ironic point of view. Mm -hmm. um, but a, a, a book that really summarizes uh, a lot of this that I wrote last year was At the Mouth of a Cannon. And it really shows what I call the triangle of the octopus, um, the church, state, and big money that from the very beginning were behind the genocide, uh, the forces that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, Weyerhaeuser, the land grab and everything through yes. the church, that's really what's still at work, that triangle. And, um, you know, so I talk about that in there. And people can see all that on Amazon. Just put on my name, Kevin, on it. You can see all my books. So your book's all on Amazon. Another thing I do is uh, I've written two books. Uh, one's a whistleblower manual which is kind of looking at a lot of the lessons when you're up against the system, how you can navigate, maneuver it, uh, and a common law training manual, how people can set up their own common law courts, their own investigations and, and movements to take power back into the community. So, so two, cr two critical tools. Very much. So that's okay. two I'd recommend as well. That is wonderful. And Murder by Decree, which has got Murder all, by the, decree, all the, the history, evidence. Yeah, the history, yeah. the history yeah, yeah. of what happens here. Yep. Um, 
you know, I just think it's remarkable that we've got this. And are there any new Vatican updates? Well, the what's going on in the Vatican, this present Pope is on his way out as well. Because all of this stuff, it's interesting. Recently, I mentioned, you know, his whole sordid background in Argentina. Um, he's had a long relationship with the Queen of the Netherlands. Her name's Maxime Zoriega. And she's Argentine as well. Her father was in the military junta. She, uh, there was a, a Dutch journalist called Ella Sturr that I work with. And Ella found out that this Maxime Zoriega has been paying the present pope 12,000 euros a month for the last nine years. Now, why she would be paying him is a question because it's interesting when a lot of these stories were first coming out about the children going missing in the Netherlands mm -hmm. uh, and this group called the Ninth Circle, which apparently is a sacrificial cult operating in the Catholic Church, child sacrificial cult. Eyewitnesses who took part in it, who were raised in these cults, have all come forward um, to describe this. You can see this on our site, murderbydecree.com, many of the testimonies. Can kind of, kind of describe what happens when we talk about these sacrifices. Well, What's happening? Here? One of these uh, people who was at that described uh, the Dutch royal family involved in this stuff. And even uh, the present pope and the predecessor at these ceremonies. So these guys are involved in more sordid things than has ever come out yet. And like with the stories that first surfaced in Canada, it begins with these anecdotes from people who saw it. And then insiders come forward. And then you get documentation. But you need somebody to go in there and initially you know, ex expose these things, and at the time people think they're crazy because this stuff can't possibly have happened, but then you are realize... These are these child sacrifices? Yes, uh, and it's it's not inconceivable when you look at all of the evidence. You know, the people all over the world are describing the same kind of ceremony going on. And um, this ninth circle, it takes its name from the nine circles of hell in the poem by Dante. Where the inferno, yeah, yeah, yeah. and and this, the ninth circle is where Satan resides, mm -hmm. along with people who've betrayed a sacred trust, mm. according to Dante. So, they do that. They uh, they invert their vow to God, and they kill a child, and then sometimes cannibalize it in the ceremonies, um, according to these witnesses who were who were there. Um, now, this is being confirmed by journalists, police officers. Um, People know about it. It's like with the Indian residential school crimes for a long time. Mm -hmm. If you mentioned a dead child 15 years ago, they'd think you're crazy. Now everyone's talking about it. It's it's an accepted topic to say yes, children died in these Indian schools. I think the same thing is going to come out about these, these sacrificial things. And that's why uh, that you know I mentioned uh, Pope Francis meeting with the head of the Mormon Church. Sure. Yes. The Mormons are involved in these same activities, and I think the reason they allowed that Mormon temple to be open is that kind of thing is going to be going on there. It gives them another cover under which to operate. And all of this stuff is coming out now, and they, uh, frankly, the Vatican doesn't know what to do, is my reading of it. And from people we know in Rome, journalists, people inside the Curia, which is the College of Cardinals, they're all saying the same thing. They're just um, trying to create an appearance of stability while the whole thing is falling apart and I think you're you're going to see a big shift in the years to come maybe even the months to come yeah that big shift and then how was, is that going to affect the, the economies and the lives of poor people around the world it's very interesting I'm watching the Congo though yeah and your people are all screaming the Congo and Ebola and da 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 well the Congo has had a history of being negative towards the Catholic Church even though the Catholic Church has a huge control there Oh, yeah, yeah. Even Trump was very upset when the Catholics didn't get their man for president this time. So we began to look around the world. I think we could begin to see examples yeah. of what it's like when groups fight back. And we see everybody jumps on the Congo now and this and that. But, you know, they people are saying we want, our, we want 